expert presentation. We're going to talk about markers for heifer and cow conception rate. And daughter pregnancy rate at Holstein cow. So we have a couple of different pictures up here. Uh, we're talking about uh, genetics and genomics today. Why would I have a picture of a clergyman here? Why is this person important? Anyone idea? Any, anyone want to venture to guess who that person is? Mendel. There you go. Thank you very much. Mendel was a monk. And Mendel uh, uh, did research very early on on the understanding of uh, genetics in pea plants. Uh, and why do I have, being a dairy specialist, I should know the difference between this beast and this one. Why do I have a herford here? This herford is actually named Dominette. And she was the first bovine that had her genome sequenced. The first bovine. She's a USDA ARS animal, I think, in Montana or Colorado. And then, of course, we have the goal of what we're doing here is we want to increase fertility, uh, not only in Holstein cattle, but we'd like to increase it uh, across uh, dairy breeds. Okay, so we have to have a foundation for today. Uh, and not only for today, but also as you drive home and you're kind of chewing on this, uh, genetics traits pass from one generation to another. Okay, it's, pretty, it's a simple definition. Okay, from parents to children. Genomics, on the other hand, is more involved. It's focused on genetic mapping, DNA sequencing, analysis of all the information within that code, within the, the complete genome of an organism, including organizing results in databases. So this is a field that's exploded in recent years. There are universities that have buildings devoted to bioinformatics, to understanding the genome not only of animals, but of plants. Okay? So that's what we're looking at when we talk about genomics. A couple more definitions here. Genotype is the genetic constitution of an animal. And phenotype is that set of observable characteristics. Okay. Something we can see, we can measure. I have a picture here of sales prowl, uh, aftershock 3918. This is a national cow leader in milk production. And you can see in 365 days, she produced almost, what, 78,200 pounds of milk, 3,000 pounds of fat, and almost 2,400 pounds of protein. The idea here is there's a phenotype that was measured. This isn't, I think she produced 78,000. No, she produced 78,000 pounds. Okay, this is an official record. And this is very important when we're talking about genomics and when we're talking potentially about genomic testing or genotyping. The phenotype has to be accurate because we're going to associate a phenotype with the animal's genotype. So we need to know, yes, that animal is pregnant at day 35 by palpation of urine contents or ultrasound or whatever. Not, I think she's pregnant because she didn't return. Okay? So this idea of having a clean phenotype to understand the relationship of the phenotype to genotype is not only in research, it's on farm also. If there are records problems on farms, then you don't have an accurate estimation of phenotype. Okay, it's very, very important. Okay, the objective of our workshop today is to provide research results, case study information, and potential management strategies and economic benefits from using genomic testing. Our objective is not, please see, it is not to apply all dairy businesses should use genomic testing. That's not the objective. We're giving research results and potential management strategies that could benefit producers. Okay? So, in relative to not recommending this technology blanket for all producers, why would we do that? Why would we not do that? Well, we did a survey of genomic management practices of United States dairy producers. 
This is an online survey, and I'm just going to show this one graph. We asked producers to self-report 21-day pregnancy rates on an annual basis. Okay? And those you see here broken down, equal to or less than 15%, 16 to 18%, 19 to 21, equal to or greater than 22%. Okay? Average pregnancy rate in the U.S. is about 19%. Approximately now, it has gone up, okay, since uh, years back. And then we also asked producers, have you used genomic testing? You tell us. Yes, I have. No, I haven't. Okay? So you can see here, as we go across, yes, I've used genomic testing is in this maroon color. No is in this yellow color. And you can see it's not only the producers that have above average reproduction, but also producers that have below average reproduction in our sample that have used genomic testing. Okay. So the question then becomes is not only how do you uh, work with this breadth of, of management, and how is it possible to reap perhaps the, the most benefit if there appears to be something else hindering good management and reproduction? Okay? So where I'm going with this is I can go back to 1993 when Monsanto had uh, BST approved. Okay? And I worked on BST as my master's project, etc. Whether you're for or against BST doesn't really matter. What happened with Monsanto is they recognized we have to unleash an army of technical services because there will be producers across the spectrum that want to use the product. And we can't have producers at the bottom end of the spectrum not get the return on investment. So this makes everyone's job, whether you're a producer, you're a veterinarian, you're a consultant, very uh, intricate in looking at, well, where am I in not only this category, but where am I in replacements and culling? What's my business strategy, et cetera? And is there something I should fix first? So that's why we say that. On this type of situation, it could be something like, uh, working with technicians, using better bulls, a wide variety of things. So we're going to move on to what has been the historical relationship between milk production and fertility. Somebody speak out. Inverse. Inverse. One goes up, the other goes down, right? We're real good at selecting for milk. We have been. We continue to be. Okay, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Milk production on this axis here, milk production in the black squares going up from 1950 to 2000s. Okay? We have fertility shown going down. Okay, this is for Holsteins. And then fertility, we're going to talk about daughter pregnancy rate today. Okay? Daughter pregnancy rate is the percentage of a bull's non pregnant daughters that became pregnant during each 21 day period. Okay? And these are, we know they're pregnant animals. So now, we have to ask this question. Is genomic testing of cattle popular? Is this something that only a few people have done, that only a few cows have done? Or is there, are, is there a critical mass out there that have been tested? Okay. Holstein genotypes, 2009 to 2018. So these are cumulative, and there's a variety of graphs that are similar to this. But essentially, it's over 2.25 uh, million genotypes for Holstein animals. So it's a significant number. The vast majority in recent years have been females. The vast majority, not males. Okay, but there is, and there does continue to be on you if we 
segmented it, it would be on this bottom portion here of males, obviously, for the AI industry. Okay? And they continue to, to use that. But the vast majority, it's caught like wildfire, are actually females. Joe? Yes. Yes. We just noticed a little bit there on the right, you know? Yes, there is right here on this right. This is a cumulative graph, and why is that little notch there? Okay, someone asked this in Wisconsin, and uh, we sent a text to John Cole, who got this data to me. So then John Cole from USDA ARS said, I don't know, and he asked Zhao Dur who is the head of CDCB, okay? And Zhao said at that time, there were animals removed from the database for not providing appropriate information. So they must have reset something. I don't know more than that. Do you know any more, Dave, or anything? I don't know more than that. But that is real. Zhao and John said that's real. The number's not wrong. But they said, this is why we had to reset. We had to remove some animals. So I said, OK. But good, good catch, because it should continue to stair step, because it's cumulative. Exactly. So anyway, if we would throw jerseys on there, of course it would go up, OK? But Holsteins, for the most part, are the, are the impetus behind all these, uh, all these genotypes. And obviously, this has really only been available since about 2009. And we have on the axis down here the various runs. And this is up till, what is that, 09? So it would be September of 2018. OK? OK, so we're going to jump into the grant. Uh, the first grant that we're going to talk about, uh, it's a multi-institutional grant between USDA, Missouri, Washington State, University of Florida, and University of Idaho. And essentially, you can see the title there, essentially, the idea is to identify novel markers and then have producers be able to use these markers uh, for selection. Okay? So one of the questions is, you know, how do we increase fertility, or how might we increase fertility uh, using genomics? Well, the, the nice thing about genomics is that it's a marker-assisted type of selection, except using as much of the genome as possible, okay? And we do have increased feasibility due to sequencing of the bovine genome, okay? And there are new methods to efficiently genotype animals, okay? I have a colleague, and, and uh, Dave Burke has a colleague that uh, raises uh, elite cattle and has for many, many years. And he tells a story about genotyping animals many years ago, and the bill being $1,500 or $1,600, and hiding that from his wife, because he was afraid she was going to just go nuts. Well, now it doesn't cost anything like that. Now it is actually uh, uh, more reachable. But here's the, the key. Marker discovery in a research setting requires carefully phenotyped populations. Carefully phenotype populations. So we have to understand that yes, this animal is truly <coughs> pregnant, the records are good, etc. Okay? So our long-term goal, increased fertility of dairy cattle. We have two a two-pronged research approach to develop novel genetic markers of fertility in heifers and lactating cows, and then determine effects of specific single nucleotide polymorphisms, or changes in the code on daughter pregnancy rate. And then the extension approach is what you're experiencing. We've had numerous workshops uh, talking with producers, veterinarians, allied industry personnel uh, across the US for uh, the last six years. The cast of characters is here. Tom Spencer, who used to be at WSU, but is at Mizzou now. Holly Nybert is our uh, uh, geneticist, and John Cole from USDA, and there's uh, Pete Hansen. You should look familiar, huh? Good. Okay. So, our, going to our first objective, the approach was using records, Holstein heifers and herbivorous cows, these are two different populations, geographically isolated, okay? <coughs> so fertility classified based on pregnancy outcome to AI. 
The heifers had to have normal repro tract, no record of disease, display standing esters. The cows, normal repro tract, uncomplicated previous pregnancy, no record of diseases before or after AI, and display standing esters before AI. So you can say right now, time out. Real dairies aren't that way. Cows have transition problems. Cows get sick. Cows get dystocia. Okay? Hold the phone here. We have one strategy for this grant, and when Dr. Panetto talks, they have a different strategy where they included animal health. Okay? So, our fertility phenotypes in this reproduction uh, project, highly fertile, that animal's pregnant on first day out. Okay? Subfertile, she's pregnant after fourth or never pregnant. Okay? So we're, we're looking at extremes. So we have a, a Manhattan plot shown here. And the Manhattan plot essentially shows SNPs or locations on chromosomes. And each color is a different chromosome from 1 to 29, and we have the X over here. And then the data is transformed. That's your negative log 10. Don't worry, we won't ask you to do that with the calculator. But you transform the data, and you find areas of significance above this line. So what, how you would read this is, we have about 466 highly fertile animals, heifers. 368 that were subfertile. The animals were genotyped. And we found 68 loci, 68 locations, if you will, that are associated with heifer conception rate. Okay. Associated with heifer conception rate. Where would those be? How do you see those? Those are above the black line. Okay, those are the ones that are different. So animals that became pregnant on first service have a different pattern, if you want to look at it that way, than animals that didn't become pregnant or became pregnant after fourth day. Okay? So that's a good thing. So there appear to be markers for heifer conception rate. Now we go to primiferous cows. We have, again, almost 500 cows that are highly fertile, about 500 that are subfertile. And you read the Manhattan plot in the same way. We have the same chromosomes from 1 to 29 and the X chromosome. And 74 loci. 74 loci above this line are associated with cow conception rate. Okay. So the first bullet point in our summary slide, there appears to be ample opportunity to make gains, not only in primiferous Holstein cows, but in Holstein heifers with genomic selection. Second bullet point, there's two loci though, only two, on chromosome four and 27 that are in common between heifers and cows. Okay, there's only two. So at first glance, you would look at that and you would think, well, why wouldn't there be more? That, that, that's a, a good question. We know, though, from USDA and CDCD, heifer conception rate and cow conception rate are different. And they have been different in the indexes for years. So we are in agreement with previous USDA CDCB data that shows they are different. There's not a lot more. Why is it that way? Why did the animal become that way? That I, that I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't describe it this way. Okay, fertilization rate. We're gonna move on a little bit here to a different portion of the research we did. If we look at slaughter studies uh, of dairy heifers and dairy cows shortly after insemination, and then recover reproductive tracts in the slaughterhouse, flush the oviducts, we can see in dairy heifers 97 to 100% fertilization. Okay? In dairy cows, we can see 85 to 100%. Okay? So we have to hold on to that information for a second because we also looked at identific 
calcification of loci associated with embryonic and fetal loss in Holstein heifers. This data set had over 1,000 Holstein heifers. 902 heifers contributed to the embryonic loss portion and repeated embryonic loss portion. And I'll define that in just a second. Our fetal loss category had 120 heifers. So our categories, we have four different categories. No embryonic loss. Those animals were pregnant and away they went. That's it, they stayed pregnant. Embryonic loss here, okay, based on the assumption, and it is an assumption, of fertilization, these are animals that were not pregnant the first day out. Okay? They were AI, but they were not palpating pregnant. Okay? The repeated embryonic loss received AI three, four, or more times. And the idea is they were assumed to have conceived at a previous AI, then lost that conception, and can received AI three, four, or more. And then fetal loss is the easiest one because they were palpated pregnant at 35 days, then they aborted, and that's actually shown in the record. Okay? So we're going to summarize this. You can see there's three overlapping circles here. We have in this first darker circle, fetal loss. There's 174 loci that are unique to those animals that had fetal loss. Repeated embryonic loss, there were 11. And embryonic loss, there were 66. And then you can see there are some that are overlapping between those two. So this is preliminary data, it's small. We would need to design a project specifically to look at this, but it's an interesting point to kind of get at is, are these the same or are these different or are they uh, controlled differently? If we go back to the literature, there are actually six loci shared by two or more of our phenotypes, which have been associated with fertility with Nordic Holsteins, Nordic Reds, and Jerseys. So we are seeing some of the same loci, that locations on chromosomes that have actually been seen by others before. Okay? Okay. Let's take a breather for a second here, look at some max nice poles. Okay? There's no, uh, there's no uh, 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 bias here. They just happen to be bulls that I thought were important. This bull here on the left is Super Sire. Okay, Super Sire has an interesting story because it used a lot, of the family used a lot of genomic technologies and other technologies to generate Super Sire. Okay? Anyone who's a little bit older, anyone have any idea who this bull? This bull was incredibly popular. Black star. That's a black star. Okay? This bull has probably the most in common within the Holstein breed. Who is this? Elevation. Exactly. Okay. So now we'll move on to daughter pregnancy rate. Um, essentially, it's that pregnancy rate of a bull's daughter or daughters, and a one percentage point increase in daughter pregnancy rate e equates to about four days open less. Okay? So we're looking at a bull here, and we can look at any bull. I just happened to pull this bull out. Okay? This is uh, Welcome Super Patron in August 2018. This particular bull was plus 5.5 on DPR. So we can do the math to get an estimate. 5.5 times 4 gives us about 22 days open less. It's about one estrus cycle, approximately. Okay? This bull also, in August 2018, and this is an older bull now, is plus on that, still plus on that. May not hit whatever your criteria are, but still plus on that. So we're gonna hold that off, kind of put that in the parking lot for a minute, and we're gonna talk about Pete Hansen's study at University of Florida, where they obtained semen from over 500 bulls born between 1962 and 2010. And working with John Cole from USDA, they were able to segment the bulls out into high daughter pregnancy rate bulls and low daughter pregnancy rate bulls. And you can see the numbers over 200 in each group. 
And there, of course, was varying amounts of information across uh, uh, those polls. Getting to the meat of the results that they found, they found significant SNPs or significant locations on chromosomes within the bull population related to daughter pregnancy rate. They found 39. 39. Okay. That was the focus right here. They found 39 significant SNPs related to DPR in the bull population. So that's this first bullet point up here. 39 SNPs were identified that were related to daughter pregnancy rate. This is in a bull population. Here's the, one of the pieces that I want you to wrestle with a little bit. 29 out of the 39 SNPs were not significantly related to production traits. Not related to production traits. Therefore, selection for fertility without negative selection for milk yield is possible. Okay? Not earth shattering, but something we have to think about given what we always think about milk production goes up, fertility goes down. Peach group went out to a separate population of cows, geographically isolated, and of course, of course isolated in time. Um, and of the 39 SNPs found to be related to daughter pregnancy rate in the bull population, Ortega and that group found 19 that were significantly related to DPR. So there were SNPs across the bull and cow populations that maintained their association with fertility. Not every single one but there were SNPs that did, 19 out of 39. So the idea here is that these SNPs can be used to improve genetic selection, to better understand the basis for fertility. And some of these SNPs have been on this uh, gene seq genomic uh, profiler across time that he has been working with them on that. So now we're gonna go back to a cartoon that Pete Hansen uh, put together. And you know, we, we, we see this a lot, this idea of well, she's producing too much milk, or that they produce too much milk, that's why fertility gets lower. We selected for too much milk, and junk came along, and that's why fertility is, too, is low. But not only what you saw in words from the DPR study, but I showed you an example of just one bowl. And we could all pull out our smartphones right now, and you could go to your favorite AI study. And you can find bulls that are actually plus on milk and plus on fertility. Okay? So you can. So the idea that it's this simple situation of one gene or a couple of genes, milk goes up, fertility goes down, is, is, is silly. There are multiple genes we know that act on their own and in concert with others to increase fertility and also milk production. Okay? So it's a complex system. Now, I don't want you to go home saying we've solved the high milk, low reproduction. That's not my point, because if you look at very large data sets, very large data sets, when daughter pregnancy rate tends to be high, milk yield is lower. Okay? When daughter pregnancy rate is lower, milk yield is higher. So, one of the things we haven't talked about is what about the impact of management? Okay? Very short little snippet here. When you have, when you go out to a very high producing milking herd, do we tend to see, in 2018, very poor reproduction? No. No. Actually, those herds that have intense management to have very high milk production, have some of the best reproduction across herds. Okay? It's our ability to, to measure that, to understand that. Okay? But yes, very, very high herds, uh, well over 30,000 pounds, can have 21 day preg rates annualized above 30% and do. Okay? 
So expected outcomes of our grant, we'd like to see better genomic tools for predicting reproduction. We'd like to see increased reliability of estimates of breeding values for reproductive traits. Dr. DeVries is going to talk about potential management strategies and potential economic value uh, later today. And we'd like to see more rapid progress in improving this fertility. And I, you know, we have this little arrow up here um, that we'd like to see go up. Uh, now we do have, I hope you noticed, we do have that it's gone up a little bit even before our grant to things that that's, that's real. Why do you think, what might be the reasons, if you want to say multiple reasons, why fertility has gone up? Because it has in the last few years. What do you think? Uh, better management. Okay, what else? Better barrier. So uh, uh, use of, uh, of indexes. Okay, use of you know, selection. Selection. And actually what it was is it was the removal, and Dave will talk about this, of information from the big black bucket and pulling DPR out, daughter pregnancy rate out, and actually being able to include that in my selection criteria. So now I'm interested in milk, fat, protein, longevity, whatever it is, stature, no stature, medium stature, and I'm also interested in daughter pregnancy rate. And now I start selecting for that, and we find out that we can select for it. We can get those results. So the last three years, does that suggest we're plateaued? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know why the why these, and, and that would be 07, uh, I think that would be 08, 09, because our last one is 2010 on this graph. I don't if know if you go on to the CDCB website, you can see up till the, they need to have animals in their complete their first lactation to be included. So on their website, you can look up 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, and it's going up. It, that was a little plateau, and now we're shooting up again. So, so we have a website where we have a wide variety of information. Dr. Moore will talk more about this in her presentation. And we have been a wide variety of places across the U.S., as I mentioned, not only talking with allied industry, dairy producers, but also uh, veterinarians. Um, and if you're ever in Stephenville, Texas, stop in the, at the courthouse, get a picture taken next to the cow up in the air. A lot of friends and neighbors helped out with this on uh, both coasts and in between. And we have to thank them. And then, of course, all the veterinarians that helped us uh, herd managers, graduate students, etc. 